Hi, everybody. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of the issues that you guys might have had with respect to questions about uh, John Watson and B.F. Skinner and different forms of behaviorism. So I'm making this brief video to talk through the PowerPoint that I uh, uploaded earlier. So um, John Watson is widely regarded as the father of behaviorism, um, if you will. Um, in 1913, he, he published a paper called Psychology as the Behaviorist Views It. And in that paper, he advocated that psychology should be a purely objective branch of natural science, that it should be, uh, it should focus on the prediction and control of behavior, and that the principles could be applied to both animal and, and, and man. He was heavily influenced by Pavlov and Pavlov's experiments and, and, and writings at the time. And his emphasis is on Pavlovian or respondent conditioning. And this was a reaction to the, the, uh, the, the current trends of psychology at the time, and that, were, uh, that was focusing on mental events or introspection, um, and that is looking within or looking inside and trying to figure out and find out principles of psychology. So he rejected this and said that uh, introspection had no place in psychology. B.F. Skinner um, came along a few years later, and he's also called a behaviorist sometimes. Um, his first publications were in the 1930s. His book, The Behavior of Organisms, really set him apart from others. And then he applied those things to human behavior in a book called Science and Human Behavior. He wrote about 14 or 15 books and over 300 articles, so he was pretty prolific. Uh, Watson... Um, Shortly after the publication of Psychology as a Behaviorist Views, and I think about in 1920, actually left academic psychology. He was famous for doing that experiment on Little Albert um, that you guys, I think, all uh, noted or, or heard about, probably. Um, it was after, shortly after he did that experiment, he left um, academic psychology and moved into advertising. So Watson wasn't around a whole lot. He, he published a few things that were pretty important in the history of psychology, but um, and started a school of thought. But it, it's been it's been changed a lot since then. Uh, B. F. Skinner, we we called he called himself a radical behaviorist, and this was because he was treating behavior as the subject matter, or the 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 study of psychology should focus on behavior is what he was uh, uh, encouraging. He was influenced by Pavlov. But his emphasis was really on operant conditioning, um, which is different than respondent conditioning, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Mental and internal events are not causes um, of behavior, but are behavior in and of themselves to be understood um, just like other behavior. That was what was radical, according to Skinner, about his view, is that he was treating all of what organisms do, not just as... Um, uh, different uh, types of events, but the same event. So the progression of Watson to Skinner is that Watson held that internal events cannot be used as data in psychology. They weren't trustworthy just because somebody said they had, they had a feeling or an image or believed something they, they, that wasn't a valid form of, of data. Skinner thought that internal events could be used um, in, in, in psychology, they could be used as data, but they weren't to be given any special status in theories. And his, um, his, his main criticism was that these theories about internal events, mental representations, the mind, those sorts of things, rely on intervening variables. And an intervening variable or hypothetical construct or what your book refers to as an explanatory fiction are hypothetical, unobservable states or processes used to explain the relationship between events, primarily or namely independent variables and dependent variables. So um, uh, th this is this is the trouble that Skinner alluded to with respect to appealing to these is that if we have an independent variable and a dependent variable, he thought that we didn't need something in between to explain it. We should explain it on that level. So, for example, um, you know, you, you, you could think of a person, that, uh, a young woman, Samika, and she makes a decision to buy a phone, right? 
and um, she she decided to go with the Galaxy Note 10 over the iPhone 11, the Pixel 3a, and the LG K40, let's say, right? Um, the problem with intervening variables is in their circularity, okay? So circularity refers to using a term you want to define in the definition or assuming some prior understanding of some part of the term. So if you say a hill is a protrusion of land smaller than a mountain, and you say that a mountain is a protrusion of land larger than a hill, then you have a circular definition. One is being defined by the other, but not independently of one another. Likewise, we could use, or people often do use, intervening variables to explain behavior. Um, Samika does smart things because of her intelligence. She chose well. Um, she chose her Galaxy X10 or Note 10 or whatever it is over the other ones because she's smart. And her intelligence is illustrated by the fact that she does smart things. So if we say she chooses the Galaxy because she's smart, how do we know she's smart? Well, we know she's smart because she chose the Galaxy. That's a circular argument or circular logic. And the same probably holds true for the terms motivation, expectation, and information in traditional psychology. So it could be an alternative and uh, 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 a sort of understanding of Samika's behavior is that she makes good choices because she evaluates options systematically. She actually makes lists of pros and cons and they usually work out. She's done this in the past. Her father did it and taught her how to do it on another purchase. And, her, and, and this comes from the fact that her father read an article in a magazine about making lists of pros and cons because his magazine gave him good advice on in, uh, his investments. The author of the article emphasizes writing down the pros and cons because you seem to overlook the cons, etc., etc., etc. So, so it doesn't have to come from some mysterious place, come from, from an author who has experience, who writes something, and then, and then somebody reads it, and then somebody passes that down to their, their children. So this leads us to an important distinction between methodological and uh, radical behaviorism that your book is, is making. In methodological behaviorism, observable behavior is the only valid form of data. So we're only going to be looking at observable behavior. But methodolo in the methodological behaviorist world, it tells us about inner or mental events. In a, in a sense, it uses behavioral observation or experimentation as the method for viewing the mind and the mental and those hidden processes that we, we think are at work. It treats behavior as an index of underlying process. For the methodological behaviorists, they really want to study what is going on, what underlies behavior, what causes behavior. Okay, and behavior is just the output of something else. In radical behavior, behavior is, once again, this is the similarity, observable behavior is the only valid form of data, but behavior is the subject matter to explain and to understand, and it doesn't tell us anything about anything except behavior. So for the radical behaviorists, they're not looking, they're not interested in the uh, inner causes of behavior. They're not looking at an index of behavior. They're looking at um, the, the b causes of behavior at the behavioral level, the interaction between the environment and the organism. But this raises a question about what is behavior? So behavior is basically like stuff that living things do, actions that people exhibit, like running, like eating, and talking, and thinking. Thinking is something that we do as human beings. But this raises this question of, is this observable? Remember, we're still relying on observable behavior. How can we observe this thinking? So the, the position of the radical behaviorist is those unobservable things aren't special. They are behavior. But we just can't see them. And they are like a lot of other things. Okay, My uh, slide is a little bit messed up here because it's just supposed to be highlighting these three. So I don't know what's going on in your skin right now, so, so to speak. I don't know what's going on with you inside of you. I don't know what your blood pressure is, your heart rate, or their stress hormone levels, but I could 
make those public. I could use a monitor to figure those things out. I could make those internal events external. But what about thinking or talking to yourself or, or, or daydreaming? How, how, how can we get those out so that they are directly observable to somebody else? And the answer is we don't know the answer to that question. An MRI shows brain activity. That doesn't necessarily mean it's your, your daydreaming. Right? So Skinner makes this distinction between public and private events. I don't know what went on in the shower this morning either with you, but I could have put a video camera in there and then make it make it public. But the but the conundrum or the problem is still there. Um, and the and the problem is accessibility. Who has access to these particular events? Public events are events that are in principle we can we can see, we can directly observe in one way or another. And private events are those which we can't. But for Skinner, those, those, those have no special status. So methodological behaviorism treats private events essentially as causes of behavior. And the behavior that we, we see, that we observe, indicates the presence or absence of those particular private events. Right? which is circular in and of itself, but radical behaviorism views private events as part of a behavioral stream. And they are given, but they are given no special causal status. They are events that require understanding in and of themselves, not to be thought of as, as outside of, but as part of behavior and the behavioral stream. Now, now, these mental events don't have to be behavior. They can be stimuli. They can be antecedents to behavior. They can be consequences of behavior. But we don't think of them outside of the realm of a behavior, analysis, a behavior analysis. They're not different than other events in the behavioral stream, except in terms of their accessibility. So that's the key, is that Skinner's radical behaviorism encompasses all of what humans do, all what people do, all the interesting stuff, but it views it in a, in a particular way, especially with respect to the status of private events. Hopefully that helps with uh, that distinction a little bit.